The show is Engineer Your Life. I'm Lungelo K. And welcome to South Africa's trendiest podcast. Bashonjalo, Aba Piga, Baya Piga, Aba Funugu Seawarda, Cancel, Gulea Epi, Aba Kubega Benz, and Tinaso Kubega Sevens, because that's what we're called to do, and that's our vision, and we keep on going. Anyway, so today I'm dressed by Thread Life Clothing. Um, wonderful guys, man. I'll put the link to their Instagram, I'll put the link to their website in the description box. They keep dressing us, they keep supporting the vision, and we love them for that. Um, the video is also sponsored by Castle Double Malt. You know how we do. We enjoy fresh drinks while we're chilling outside in the garden. It's not the normal garden today because I think Engineer Your Life is on tour. See, all over, we need to be seen, we need, we need to be known everywhere, and we need to get you the best content with the best people. And today is no different. We have an amazing person. He is a broadcaster extraordinaire. Uh, I remember there was a point where he took a break from broadcasting and I was like, dude, someone's are learning Google because we need you. We need people like you on air. Um, we need people like you on TV. But he's not just a broadcaster. He's so much more. Let me stop talking. Let's get into the interview. Keep enjoying. There are aspects of my life um, that I will never reveal um, that are between myself, my family. On the third day. On the third day. Uh, so my dad, <laughs> that one, yeah. Like Christ himself. What was that about? I don't even and know. I don't fancy know. Restaurant. Um, um, in a beautiful place in South Africa. And he Mal left you with love them. Love them. Ooh, He's not circumcised. I, mean, I, <laughs> yes. I mean, not just so it, for Mawat Fundis and all of that. I mean, I heard the, the audible voice of God. It wasn't a decision. It wasn't a Well, because and you keep on coming back to the podcast and we thank you so much. And anyway, since we are here, um, I gave you another amazing guest. No, wait for it to land. I think just wait for it. <laughs> like, is it just searching? It must be the hills. No, I think it's somebody's next door. Oh, wow. Well, that estate on the other side is... It's got people who've got choppers. Chankura. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One thing, speech that I want to talk to you about because it, it's it's so important. Why are you the man with the most perfect skin in the world? Yo, that's, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to take that title. I think there are people who with uh, such amazing, beautiful genes out there. Mm -hmm. But I'm flattered every time I get to to hear it. So you're just saying it's genes? I think well, and also taking care of yourself. I think it's very important for you to take care of yourself in as much as you take care of yourself internally to make sure that you're healthy. You also need to make sure that you, you know, you maintain a certain, a certain look, especially if you're going to be in the showbiz industry. But for me, it was never a vanity thing. I think genes have got uh, quite a lot to do with it. But just generally, I'm a person who likes to take care of myself. I think um, I think I wouldn't be doing justice. This is the beauty of podcasts. You have mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I wouldn't be doing justice to everyone who's watching us yeah. if I'd say one minute your basic skincare routine mm, I think the three steps are very important mm -hmm. um, you definitely need to exfoliate once in a while it doesn't have to be everything but you do need to make sure that you cleanse your skin to get rid of the dead skin cells you know the dead that we, you know we would get throughout the day you must tone uh, and then of course you must moisturize and now another big thing that I had to learn when I turned 30 because your skin is not as elastic <laughs> as it used to be I am now very much big on the serums, you know, okay. vitamin serums. So um, my dermatologist back in the day, believe it or not, back when I was in high school, I had acne. And when I what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So when I got to varsity, then I thought, you know what, let me go see a dermatologist. And one thing that he told me, which I, I think I carry throughout, is the very same way you take care of your body and you want to make sure that it's got nutrients by what you consume, you know, your food and your nutritional content. Um, it's the very same way that your skin will need those nutrients. So yeah, yeah. make sure that, you know, whatever product that you get, it's got that nutritional composition that, that's suitable for your skin, mm. you know. So uh, people are walking around. Sometimes we think we're got um, you know a very bad skin condition whereas it's just you know a nutritional deficiency that
that you you could fix by making sure that you balance the vitamin C or the omegas or whatever that your skin needs. So yeah, that's that. It's the three steps. Make sure that you cleanse, you tone, and you moisturize. And after a while, or maybe after a year or two, actually even if after six months, make sure that you also review your product. Is it still working for my skin? Is it what my skin needs right now? Environmental mm. conditions at times, you relocating, moving to another place, yeah. the climate conditions, all those things tend to affect uh, your skin. And of course, try not to stress as much. And that was the end of the episode on the, on the, <laughs> on the skin masterclass. <laughs> Switch, officially welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Um, um, it's beautiful to have you. Um, thank you for trusting us. I'm always a bit nervous when I have a person mm-hmm. who has a strong traditional background in broadcasting mm-hmm. because they can see through this mess that we do on podcasts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so welcome. welcome. Thank you so much. And I must say congratulations on what you have started. I love people who basically go for the unconventional. Mm-hmm. And as a person who's skilled in another profession, for you to be able to follow your passion, um, you know, around broadcasting. Broadcasting is very wide. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be one thing within the traditional space. Um, I mean, we're seeing quite a rise of podcasts uh, in our country as well. So to see a lot of particularly young people getting into um, that space is very encouraging. And I encourage any other person who wants to do it, who wants to make sure that they create a space for conversations, uh, for social cohesion or whatever. So congratulations. Well done. Keep it going. Um, and you, you, you'll never know what it will lead to. Thank you so much. Um, mm. It's not about me today. <laughs> um, uh, just a question since we're there on the subject of podcasts. Yeah. Why do you think women are not starting podcasts? Are women not starting podcasts? Think of, just give me, I, I can't actually think of one right now, especially in South Africa, that's female-led and the, there's a female anchor. Really? That, that would be, well, I've never paid attention to that, you know, to just check gender parity within the space mm. with regards to who amongst the genders is, is leading in terms of uh, setting podcasts. But that would really be unfortunate because I'd like to think that women are engineers of conversations mm. in general. And if there is a space that's to embrace women or to embrace conversations in general, it would have to be podcasts because you then get to have conversations and filtered absolutely um so i've never really paid attention to it you know so this is shocking to me but i do know that within the traditional space which is your radio predominantly there's been a conversation over the years as to why you have a very uh, limited number of uh, women hosts uh, who are leaders as opposed to co-hosts and of course uh, within that um, you would have the conversation then going to you know um the demographics as to what listeners prefer you know they'll prefer the male voice at this hour the female voice at this hour but we're seeing quite a lot of that change within the industry and I think it is important then to also encourage women to then start their own podcast you know start your vlog um, um, and and just be and create a space for women to to find an expression of who they are from somebody that they're watching on the internet on YouTube um, who might not finally or maybe normally find space within your TV or your radio Um, it would be sad for women not to be a part of um, this space, uh, but, this yeah. space, yeah. but um, I would like to think a lot of women would love to to start podcasts. I want to go. To, I want to go to how your journey started. Um, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll just fast forward to you leaving school and mm-hmm. getting into university. Um, are you trained as a journalist, and is uh, that how you got into the media space? Yes, I'm a trained journalist. Practiced as a journalist um, for a few years, and then moved into the corporate. Um, I would say the the, the communication space rather, um, and then got into broadcasting, and then after years in broadcasting, and then went back into communications. And now I'm in a beautiful space where I tend to and get to do it all. <laughs> <laughs> the power of balance, I think, is very important. And it's a journey thing. Um, you start at a certain point, I think, as you evolve, as you grow as a person and as a professional, most importantly, you then get to identify areas within the profession that work for you. So for me, I remember in varsity when I think we're doing our final year, and one of our lecturers wanted to know which um, areas within journalism um, would you know particularly want to specialize in 
And, and I remember Depp Rabat was quite big at that time, and a lot of us wanted Con to be like, investigative journalists, yes, wanted yes, to go to yes. Iraq, <laughs> you know, <laughs> find the Osama Bin Laden. But I remember I said, I just want to, I want to tell people stories, right? I want to tell human stories. Um, and, and as a result, my brand of journalism was never to, you, you know, to, to sensationalize or over sensationalize reality because we find that quite a lot in South Africa. But I think just in general, um, in the country, in the world, you look at countries like your America where paparazzi is, you know, it's quite big and, you know, the sensationalism of the reality of lives of those who are within showbiz. But then also when you tend to look at your politics, um, you know, in South Africa within that context, we're seeing quite a lot of people who, even though there's a positive in it, but um, I always find that the, the, the objectivity part um, of your journalism brand then gets compromised quite a lot because there are factions within that, that space. And I think for me particularly, I just wanted to be able to go and tell a story that is life-changing or afford an opportunity to somebody whose story might not make it to um, a CNN, an SABC, a carte blanche, right? But the fact that you're a journalist and you're trained, you then um, get to implore mechanisms that are going to assist that person to be able to tell their story. If you're going to Soweto and you are taking a taxi, you then get to hear human stories. You know, the clinic, I went to the clinic and there's no panado, yeah. there's no water, the school, uh, the schools got closed, I went to home affairs, they don't have this and that, and those are human stories. Mm. Then you get to be a part of that um, uh, and get to be that important tool mm. as a journalist to then take those stories from their reality and be able to dispatch them. And, 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 and the powers be then get to be challenged by those stories being aired and, 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 and in their respective positions and roles, then, you know, they, they will be challenged in a way to, to get to do something, to change the reality of those South Africans. So for me, journalism was that, and that's where I started. And I got to a point where I realized, you know, I, I wanted more. And within my brand, brand of journalism, then I moved into broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Started. Um, Thank uh, goodness, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, started, uh, you know, as a, a, a talk show and a current affairs host at the SABC. Uh, there was a show on SABC One, uh, Yelunga Lolako, which I started at the age of 24. Um, and then I just grew within the space. You know, there's so many shows that I've done. I've done your Sunday Live, I've done your Rights and Recourse, I've done Question Time. And those are shows that required you to be in tune with what's happening around the country. Mm -hmm. Current affairs. Um, to know, so, you know, yeah. you need to understand current affairs, but uh, more so, you you need to identify um, because there are so many people who are within the space. But find a niche and find that one thing that works for you. Maximize on that, and then just run with it. I remember when I started broadcasting, and I had to uh, just within few a few weeks um, hosting um, the show. There was a political figure who was highly controversial at the time, and I was told by my executive producer that, oh, well, you know, we actually need you to do this interview. Mm -hmm. And I was so scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember he said to me, always remember that you're in control and you get to direct the narrative of the conversation. Of the conversation. But also ask yourself, why am I doing this interview? Is it, uh, you know, for vanity, the fact that I've interviewed the president mm -hmm. of this in this mm -hmm. country, or am I trying to get the truth out of him? And I think I then took that principle and I ran with it throughout my broadcasting career. So yeah, it's been quite a ride and uh, I think I've been fortunate and blessed to to then be afforded opportunities to then grow and expand within what I love and what I do to get to evolve as well you know and to move around and to try different things. Um, TV has very different technicalities to radio so mm -hmm. you started your broadcasting career in TV with all these different... Actually um, when I was in varsity okay. I did I did campus radio oh, okay. and I always tell people that from the first year within three months I was called come and read news uh, we think you can do it mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. I went and I read news and they were like oh wow um, read news then and then I was a news reader and then within a few months uh, the drive time host was not there and they said we think you can do it mm -hmm. and then I did campus radio so my training
training started there. Okay. By the time I got to a real big platform, I already had that training. I remember, you know, back in the day when I was in varsity, when I used to go to a lot of these um, auditions. And every time I went to an interview, especially um, audition, particularly for, for entertainment shows, they would always say, you belong to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you've got such a very a strong command uh, of, of voice, this and this. Of yes, you know, so you would definitely do well in talk. And I didn't understand it then because yeah. I was 21 and I wanted to say, do go, do go, sell my tools <laughs> in, you know, like other youngsters. But yeah. I then got to realize that, you know, we're all called for different things within Absolutely. the space. And it's quite big. And it then challenged me because when I got into broadcasting and journalism, I realized that you, you can't just go and switch on the microphone on radio. You can't sit, you know, go be in front of the camera and say you're going to drive a conversation without you doing research. You Absolutely. need to know exactly what you're talking about. You need to have your facts. But at the same time, um, you are not out there to, to ambush uh, people. Even though maybe sometimes they might not be telling the truth, your job as a host or as a broadcaster is to make sure that you steer them towards the, the right direction yeah. and the truth. Yeah, yeah, and they, yeah. they get to tell it themselves. But, but then, so you have this campus radio background. Mm -hmm. You go into TV. I mm -hmm. know TV has a, a national footprint, so mm -hmm. you are exposed to that national footprint. Yeah. But doesn't imposter syndrome then come and attack you when your first, I'd say now it's your first radio gig, your first real radio gig mm -hmm. is a prime time show on Umshaba? So before Umshaba, I was a newsreader on, 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 on uh, Radio 2000. Okay. All right. And I think even though, I, I mean, as a newsreader, it's, it's always the host saying, oh, and it's time for the news. The news um, uh, speeches up with the news. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in your booth and you read your news for and, a few then minutes you leave, and then you write you out. Uh. I think when the Umshobo when because I was 27 when I got to Umshobo and I'm doing a prime slot that was um, generally in the past done by icons, you mm -hmm. know, OTC, DTSI, there are people that grew up listening, the likes of Amaza was still at the station, you know, people are doing really, really well. And I was this young person who just wanted to get into the space and do what I want to do. But I think at the time, having a management um, that really believed in me, because when they came to me, all I wanted to do was to do talk. So I just said, well, if there's a slot, um, I think I would do talk. But then I, I remember the then station manager said to me, I've been watching your work on TV and I've always known that you're a radio head. So I think you do fairly well within the space. So I had to quickly then learn to um, bring in the fun, spunky side in to, me. To your personality. Because yeah. I was so used to doing talk, right? You just switch on the microphone. What I know matters is the content. And now when you get to a slot where there's even music, there's an entertainment element, but at the same time, you're going to, you know, have maybe 15 minutes where you're driving a conversation and you're engaging listeners. So I think for the first few months, um, and they allowed me that, you know, to 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 learn to to sort of shed off that talk show host uh, skin and and then get to to being a versatile broadcaster. And I'm so glad I got to do it then because I got to realize a lot of things about me that oh, I actually like this. Oh, I can actually just be casual on radio. You know, it doesn't have to be hard all the time. And so that versatility was very important because I could switch on heads on and off. And Umshla Bonene then also brought me back to my objective as to why I got into journalism. Mm -hmm. Got to be in touch with people's realities. You have Umam 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 Magumedo is going to call you somewhere a Lokshin or you know Umam Dolo is in the rural areas. And they all get to connect with you because you have brought in the subject. You know, you're talking about family dynamics. Everybody has got you know something to say. You're talking about um, money. You know, you're talking about sex, anything, politics. Everybody wants to partake in this God of you. Yeah. So you know that 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 imposter syndrome. Of course, it will come in the sense that I thought, who Mshabonene is the second biggest radio station in the country. Mm. You know, and it's hundred percent closer. And yes, I'm very good in the closer. Um, but you know, am I good enough? for the slot now. Yeah, yeah. And I think having managers at the time, the programs manager, the station manager, and even the, uh, you know, the PGM, um, and the head of radio uh, at the SABC at the time kept on saying to me, you've got all it takes, and yeah, so keep yeah. going. So, And also what I had to do, I had to silence all the naysayers. The noise, right? And you have to silence the noise and then sort of focus at this particular point, um, focus and listen to the people who, who are going to affirm and validate you so that you get to present yourself fully prepared and ready to take on the opportunity and do your very best. I, I definitely agree with you saying 
saying that you you found your casual side, you mm -hmm. even found your funny side. Yes. Um, where you are right now is definitely the funniest you've ever been. You, know, you, you are so who you are. You are I, so self-aware. I think I am very comfortable in who I am right yes, now. Yes, yes. Um, funny, it's funny, I've got a friend of mine, Alfie, who always talk about this, and so when they were talking about, um, because now he's also in the industry, and I always say, I've always struggled with the idea that I'm funny. I don't mm. think I'm funny. Mm. And he'll say, but you are funny. I'll say, yes, maybe I am, but I wouldn't like to to brand myself as a funny person. I think yeah. there are people who can do well in that space. I mean, we've got comedians, funniest people in, in the country. We've got the likes of Skumba, Bo Celeste. Mm. Those are people who, who really live and breathe humor. I think mine comes when it comes, and and it is, it's subtle somewhere there, but I think I, what I can agree um, on with you is, 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 is the fact that I'm very comfortable in my skin right now. I, but I've, I've never been easily shaken, mm -hmm. or I've never been one to try to um, confine myself within spaces so that I can be, you know, part of the crew. I've always stood out, you know, I look different, I speak different, I dress different. You, you just can't help but spot me yeah. and remember me, right? And I think that has always been that for me. And it's not something that I consciously did, but I think I've always been a person who just stand, stands out from the rest growing up. And I got to a point, of course, with growth and being comfortable in your skin and understanding certain things, why well, I got to embrace that. And once you embrace that, it's beautiful because once you get into an industry with people who are very opinionated about a lot of things, they'll be open, opinionated about what you say. Um, they will misinterpret whatever you say you're Deliberate. right. Deliberately, <laughs> right? They will be on a mission to try to uh, tarnish your reputation, right? And there will just be people who are drawn to you, but they just don't know how to digest that attraction. I hear you. You know, why am I drawn to him and then oh let me be a troll you know and tarnish him and I think when I started out in the industry a lot of people had quite a lot to say about my looks you know this and that and that and that and this and that and that and that and I, I had to make sure that I've got a safe space where I go regroup and remind myself who I am and 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 what to listen to and what not to listen to and then you shock us, speech, mm. while you've grown into this person that, oh, Mama, Basim Tanzani, or uh, Kings Williamstown, mm -hmm. or Tata Love. You shock us now. You, you, you're celebrating big numbers. Mm -hmm. um, DSTV is affirming you with a nomination for a radio oh, award. Yeah. And then you come and shock us and you say, bye, radio. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> I'm a firm believer that you must always live at your prime. Okay. Right. So the broadcasting space is a very ruthless space in the sense that people can easily get caught up in the hype of things at the moment. So because you're doing a trendy slot at the moment, you are in your prime time right now, you then forget to plan ahead and think, what's next for me? Exactly. Right? Yeah. What's next for me? Is this what it's going to be? So mm. think about it this way. Yes, in campus, I was doing campus radio because I was trying to finish up a qualification, but then I knew how I wanted to diver diversify in the industry. At 22, I was a communications officer in parliament. I left that at the 20 age of 24. I was doing the show SABC One and also a news researcher at the SABC. Um, and then I grew and I grew went into lecturing at some point I've always wanted to um, be versatile right in what I do and diversify do as many things as possible so when I turn 30 I always say it's not a switch per se but I, I started having those kind of conversation of what, what the next decade is going to be about am I going to be caught up in the hype of the moment in the fact that oh I've got great numbers and even have a DSTV nomination mm -hmm. so why leave right the next slot is going to be a drive slot and then maybe from there it will be the two flagship shows. I'll be tossed between the breakfast and you know. And before you know it, it's been 15 years and 20 years of, of you doing the same one thing. same thing, like, right? Going in. You've the just been going into in, in circles. And the fact that you know, because it's it's what you're naturally gifted in, it is so easy and, and tempting for you to just say. 
I am, it's easy work, right? Broadcasting is not easy, yes, but it's easy work. You don't get to spend 15 hours at work mm. doing mm. one mm. and the same thing, right? You've got a team that will support you. Um, you go and you do your show for three, four hours, and yes, of course, it's not just that three hours. There's maybe an extra hour or two in between just for preparation and all that. But my show was doing, it was at the time the second biggest after, um, second biggest show in the station because the breakfast has always been the breakfast show, mm. uh, the biggest show. When my show was bigger than the drive show, um, and you know, I remember the time there was this whole debate or questioning is how how is this possible? Mm -hmm. You know, because I took the show uh, from um, the twelfth. There was there's an hour a news hour from twelve to one, so we took it from one o'clock to three o'clock, and it you know the numbers went up, and um, then the drive team would come, and the DSTV nomination um, came. And and uh, I had to sit and ask myself, okay, so clearly um, somebody out there is watching, mm -hmm. uh, besides the listeners um, outside the SABC, who then recognizes the work that I do, but then is this it for me? And then I thought, no, this is not it for me. You know, there's so much more that I want. And I always tell people that 30, if you are conscious and aware and, you know, in tune with yourself, you know, just maybe to, to check if I'm still on the right path, am I still doing the right thing? 30 is always a game changer for some people. And for me, it was a game changer because I thought, so in 10 years, I'll be 40, right? And, and, this decade needs to be for something else because my 20s were for trying out new things, um, you know, getting into businesses I had no idea what they were about, registering companies, you know, trying this, trying that. And then I wanted to make sure that when I get to 30, I at least know what is it that I want and what is it that I do not want. And it's yeah, not just a career thing, generally in my life, right? In relationships, in family dynamics, all of that. I needed to make sure that I know what is it that I want, what is it that I can do well. What is it that I cannot do well? And so also with Om Shobo and NFM, I had to, at the time, sit and have those conversations. And the following year, early beginning of the year, I got an opportunity to go back into um, communications. And uh, I this had that government now. Yes. So, yes, so, I so this is where we're all asking, Well, <laughs> <laughs> so Well, <laughs> I can't speak for other people, but for me, it's where I started <laughs> yeah, anyway, you know. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I was doing comms um, in, in Pali. And uh, what happened is from then, I got this opportunity in communications. I went to, I was director of communications and marketing at the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. It afforded me an opportunity to then get into um, the whole mechanism of communications because communications and communications communicators, especially for the public sector, are very important. Mm -hmm. You then get to be a mouthpiece and to showcase that which government is doing. But for me, I was going to be a part of a department of communications and digital technologies, and there was this whole fever, 4IR uh, talk, yeah. exactly. But from a policy perspective, to understand what's the plan of government when it comes to bridging the digital divide in the country, what's the plan to make sure that those who do not have access to resource and to network um, are then brought closer to resource. If the country is going to move towards, towards that direction where the use of artificial intelligence is going to be central, not just in the use of gadgets, but also in the economy, we hear people talking about smart cities, who then gets to participate in that? But then what informs all of that is the policy direction that the country takes, right? How do you regulate the different sectors that are part of digital technologies and communications in the country? And to work with the different sectors and all of that and to bring innovation there. So so that's what I left broadcasting for, mm -hmm. right? And and I remember when I my then co-host was in Lembusi Baby Z, you know, we're having the one-on-ones and hearts to hearts. And she said, you know what I appreciate about you is that you're not saying you'll never come back to broadcasting. You're saying for now, right? It could be, I don't know how long it's going to be, but for now I need to go and focus into something else. Um, and I made sure that I do not do 
anything else but that. You know, my business ambitions packed on the side, my broadcasting ambitions packed on the side. I am particularly focusing on what I left to do. And it was a great, challenging, stretching exercise and opportunity. And I'm glad that I took that, um, you know, that jump at the time to leave the Monday to Friday radio um, and, and the endorsements that comes with, with and all of that, you know, is money that you get to make to go and be a part of a strategic position that would then get to expose me to a lot of things. And after two years inside, and then I thought, you know, now I can bring in this, now I can do that. Oh, now business can come in. Now I can do a radio on weekends, right? Now I can start that. I can, you know, so so it's it's been, it, again, it goes back to what I was saying about growth. Putting yourself in positions that will allow you to grow gracefully without the noise until you get to a time where you're saying, I can bite some more. I, hear I can take more. Don't bite more than you can um, you, more than you can chew. They say, so that's that's what the entire transition was about. And yes, my listeners were crying. No, you can't. And uh, for me, it was in as much as I loved, uh, and I still love my listeners. I love people who support what I do. It was about that being strategic and making sure that I align myself with something greater. Uh... Speech is sounding, this is me echoing somebody who's watching now. Speech mm -hmm. is just trying to sound poetic about why he got into communications mm -hmm. um, and government. But deep down, he's in the ANC, and that's how he got everything. And that's why he can switch between SABC government mm -hmm. as he pleases. No, not even. I will not be sitting here and be in a position to say, oh, no, this is the political party I'm voting for. Mm. No, 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 no. I think, firstly, I am highly skilled in what I do um, and I've gotten this far and gotten every opportunity on merit and this is why I can sit confidently here and say oh well if you're saying there's an opportunity I got um, that I didn't deserve unwarranted test me you know go check my track record uh, there isn't a thing I do and do not excel in right so to say we get you get an opportunity because of affiliations well maybe uh, there's an opportunity or a door that will open because of whom you're affiliated to in fact um, in fact uh, i can get you here because mm -hmm. we've met before mm -hmm. and we have some sort of relationship and yeah. i have your cell phone number yeah. that is an affiliation and you we exploit affiliations in life that's it and we also need to move past you know it's one thing for for one to and i do understand where where it comes to the issue of political appointments, which, by the way, was not the case to me. in my case. I applied, like everybody said, that 83. <laughs> and there was an, in, you know, an interviewing process, which was yeah. public. Um, it is okay for people to question and to bring government into account, right? We do understand that nepotism is quite big in our country. We do understand that, um, especially the, what's the seeming attack on SOEs and their poor performance is at times a result of political appointments, right? Putting people in positions who have no clue um, what the core business of that particular SOE or government department is. However, I always say your network is your net worth. Absolutely. If you meet people for the sake of meeting them, this is what I always say when I go and speak to, um, you know, startup professionals or I go to universities. I always say, if, and, and this is how I got trained by my lecturer at the time, he used to say, if you find yourself stuck in an elevator with a CEO of a big company, listed company that you'd love to work for, and you're stuck for three minutes. He's got his bodyguards, his protectors, his PA. Um, he's not even looking at you. What are you going to say? Are you going to stand there and just be and so I'm, happy? Oh, and, oh my God, I'm here with uh, yeah. Bill Gates, right? Or are you going to use your 60 seconds to make sure that you create an impression so that you open a door and you make sure that he remembers you? Um, and who knows what opportunity he could have? 
And I am so for that. I think over the years, like I said, started quite young in the industry. And the fact that I believe in building a healthy and solid network. And I will not be shy um, when it comes to sometimes accessing those networks to make sure that I advance myself career-wise, personally, or business-wise. It is no shame. However, what is important is to make sure that in you doing that, you then do not implicate yourself in things that will number one compromise you number two um, risk other people and number three um, be corrupt in one way or another right so if there's anyone in that opinion well sorry I'm <laughs> um, we, we work hard this side and we're good at what we do why do you block so quickly on Twitter because I can <laughs> like every other week somebody will show a screenshot of uh, questions that will be blocked you <laughs> because I can so this is what people need to understand social media is not the world right yeah. I don't build my house on social media I choose and I curate what I put out there on social mm -hmm. media so if I get on Twitter and I decide oh I'm just going to be part of a silly conversation it is purely that a silly conversation if you are going to think that is entirely who I am and brand me based on that particular tweet, I'm open to you engaging me, mm -hmm. but there are terms of engagement Absolutely. anyway, right? Do not do it maliciously. Do not disrespect me. Do not think I'm a walkover, and do not think I'm just going to allow you to. Mm -hmm. And at times, because that's the energy that you're walking into, uh, in with, in my space, I have every right to say, not today. Block you, and I move on. And this is what I say about people. Because people, I don't know whether we don't have is in those or wins, or maybe we really need to do better things. The unemployment we rate really needs to be... And it's not yeah. even that, I mean, there are a lot of people who are employed who yeah. are on social well, media. I just think people need to understand that that is a platform and it's an app that you can log into and log out right and I wrote the other day um, somebody said oh my god uh, the youngins uh, the, 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 the young uh, uh, thingy uh, trolls oh no they edit they are saying this and this and I said so that I'm actually in Durban I'm having such a great day I had a beautiful meeting and I'm drinking champagne yeah <laughs> I'm not on Twitter right now and if I get on Twitter and I see, oh, there are about, what, 60 people who are trolling me, well, I can get off the, the app or just lock my account or block you if you're really relentless. Mm. I don't know you personally. I don't need to know you personally. I'm blocking you there. And when I meet you in the street, I won't even recognize you. And that's the thing. So that's why I'm saying social media is not the world. There is a world out there. And as soon as people understand what is it that they take into social media, when I go on Instagram, I don't show 90% or 100% of my life I could be showing just five percent because we curate what we put out there so I have every right to protect myself and your um, peace and my peace and to say I'm not here to geez have a political debate with you or I'm not here to redeem and to prove myself mm. to you there are places where I can go and prove myself and 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 my intentions thereof and this is another thing this um, cancel culture is quite a big uh, conversation I always say unfortunately there are a lot of gullible people on social media. If one person decides to drive a certain narrative about one person, you've got a flock, or a flock of people who then and follow if, into and with, that. And if it's the so-called right person who has the right influence on that platform, mm -hmm. on Twitter, um, there are trolls who are faces of trolling on that app. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they want to lead that conversation, for example, mm -hmm. at the moment, we have an influencer whose name is being drilled down mm -hmm. our throats day in, day out mm -hmm. by a certain person who calls himself a blogger on social mm. media so but she's she's never on social media when those things happen right and Mauritius darling <laughs> half of the time she she you know she she will not even be aware because that's the case that's the thing the day I decided okay you get on social media you say what you need to say you get out was the day I had the most peace uh, yeah so half the time somebody says something nasty I'm not even I, I didn't even see it so well good for you, you had the attention you had 120 retweets I don't know, go bank them, go buy a Maserati, but I'm not there. And so blocking is self-care, self-love, and saying I'll not engage you on that level. And I choose to and have every right to. Yeah. So farewell.
You have a very beautiful tattoo of Anu Nozi. I, I just oh, can't stop staring at you. Oh, she's my mom. This is my mom. This is my mom. Yeah. Uh, she she's passed. still around. No, no. She passed okay. on. That's why we've got two years. Okay. She passed on. Um, wow, it's been 25 years. 1997. 25 years. Yeah. So. Um, so many of us are without mothers. My goodness. Queen of my heart. So yeah. I decided when I'm having my first tattoo, she's going to be the one. That's, that's lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're very deliberate, as you're saying, mm. with showing a, a small percentage of your life on, on Twitter. You're also mm. saying you're 30, so you're self-aware about what you want. Oh, no, no, no. 32. Turning 33 this year. Turning 33. So citizen. you're in that journey. <laughs> um, you're in that journey where you know many things that you want and exactly how you want them to, to be done. Mm. Ne? You, you've never showed us a partner. Why not? I don't have to. <laughs> Again, social media is not the world. And even if it was the world, yeah. this, uh, I of the belief that I don't have to prove any point on social media. I'm very content in who I am and what I have. And I've got a very solid social circle right around me. I've got a very f strong family uh, support system, friends. Friends I've had for, what, 15 years or, or more. You know, people have been in my life for, 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 for longer. And so I believe there are certain parts of me that I just need to enjoy with those people. Yeah. Right? I don't need to show the world what I'm doing every day. I don't need to show the world whom I'm with every day. And I don't need to then also parade my partner um, for what good? You know, it, it, that's the question I always ask myself. So I think that part of my being and my personal life, I just want to be very selfish of, uh, but, you know, about but it. But what do you say about people whose, I wouldn't say it's their brand, mm. but they've made it a point to parade their partners? It's their choice. Mm. I can't dictate upon them what they need to do. They've got every right to do so if it feels right to them. And this is why I'm saying personally, it's not even a thing I think about. Um, because why do it? Right? I'm not saying I'll never do it. Maybe there will be a day, maybe when I show you guys that I've been married for five years, you'll be shocked <laughs> when, I, when I post my, my wedding picture five years later. But personally, I just think there are parts of us that we would really need to enjoy. Personal, personally, for me, this is my principle. Um, there are parts of me that I just want to enjoy. There, there are times where I travel and I, I don't post. There are times where I'm really in a good space and something great is happening. And my phone is far away, you know, and I've had to learn that because, again, with you thinking that everything needs to be on social media, the temptation to just share everything is very high. And before you know it, you have overexposed yourself. And so when people are starting to query certain things about your personal life, you then get agitated. Well, you overexposed. Well, you, you overexposed. Them, them, right? So it's my personal brand. It's what I choose to do. If the next person wants to do it, it's okay. And really, I have no say in that. Can't dictate that. I, I get that. Um, we woke up one day and there's a nice logo all over your social media mm -hmm. saying Must Stand the Group. What's that vision? Because I, at the moment it's giving me luxury cooking. Mm -hmm. It's giving me that aesthetic. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's that about? So that's my baby. That's my new business. I love it because it's allowing me to to try to innovate, to to do as many things as I want to do within the business. Mastandi is, I would say, God-given vision. And how it came about, when I moved back to Gauteng from um, Cape Town, and I was looking for a house to buy, that after I had made the patches and I was just walking around again, that's just a part in my uh, Insta stories where I was engaging and I was saying, oh, okay, guys, so you guys are going to help me decor this space. What can I put? And I remembered that my grandma loved to use the term mustandi, ne? and mustandi referring predominantly within the black community Landlord. to homeowners, home, yeah. yeah, homeowners <laughs> and landlords. So you must be a homeowner first, then yes. you can be a landlord. <laughs> um, and 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 and. So so it's a casual term that would use at home. But when I bought that house, there was something very special about it, right? And I just thought of my grandmother who's late. And one of the followers who was commenting on the live uh, that was uh, happening at the time said, ah, must Andy, right? And I don't know, it just clicked. Something, something got ignited in me. And the next couple of months, I was 
sitting working on a business concept um, around home ownership and being a part of celebrating home ownership amongst the black community but not just that um, the vision behind Mustandi is everybody can buy a house, all of us who can buy houses, but it takes a special effort to make it a home, mm -hmm. homely. And so what are the things that make a house a home? Mm -hmm. And that is where the business gets to maximize. So it's a home convenience business, but the vision is bigger than just it being about cooking or deco and all of that. Like I said, we are strategically also trying to get into spaces where we can be role players when it comes to you know the property space in the country um, there are so many divisions that products also that we are going to release that are not just about cooking you know um, so my study is that in the past couple in the past 12 months I would say what a journey it's been um, I think when I started definitely food is always the easiest thing to start with um, I had my first event at the time and the first people who went to assist me on the cooking part it was my helper and my cousin brother who was, mm -hmm. was in town and we served um, the client was happy and we took a picture and I was just sharing it on social media to say listen if a dream comes start right start just start that's what matters start go register that company put on that vision together um, think and pray about people who are going to be aligned to that vision who will assist you to get to where you need to be and I think in the past 12 months when the vision started to expand in my mind and I started you know thinking okay this business could go further um, than I initially thought it would and I can actually put all my business ambitions into this one group uh, which is must and being um, now it's must and group it's going to be you know um, basically your host business mm -hmm. um, with a number of businesses that are going to be you know under, yeah. Yeah. so so that's what it's been and I've been setting the foundation for the past 12 months it's been a lovely ride I've been learning so much um, my business, um, 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 I'll, I'll say the entrepreneur in me also has been really getting empowered because entrepreneurship is not easy at all, right? It's not easy. And within that, I think a lot of people then get to, to quit because when you start something just purely based on passion, it, it can work or cannot work, right? What happens then in times where the passion itself is not self-serving or it's not growing the business? You need to be able to think and to amplify the vision strategically. So for me, it was that setting the foundation in the past 12 months. But I can tell you, the next couple of years are going to be amazing when it comes to this business. And I think for me, also, this chapter of my life is about ensuring that in as much as I grow and expand and creating wealth as well, I also get to create business opportunities for other people. And, and not just business opportunities, but employment opportunities. Yeah, yeah, the country yeah. is facing the highest number of unemployment in the history and so I think business particularly the business sector has got a very important role to play when it comes to that and I would love for my company to be one of the companies then that, that get to you know participate within that space and grow it. Um, we're nearing the end of our conversation. I want to I want to uh, play a little game that I love playing with my my guests, uh -huh. uh, but particularly because <clears> this <throat> game it, it it gives me an opportunity to get an instant answer out of you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want you to give me a long explanation. It must okay. be a brief explanation. So the, the name the name of the game is called One Must Go. One Must Go. Okay. Yes. So sure? I'll give you two what things. Two names or two I don't know things, Jay. Uh -huh. that but one must go, and then you must mm -hmm. give an explanation of why you're letting that one go. Okay. Okay. One must go. So do I need to say why I'm letting yes. you go? Yes. Brief, okay. brief, brief, brief explanation. Yo, hold on. I've One must go. TV or radio? TV can go. Okay. But why are we letting go of this big screen? TV can go because... You are sitting here, you have this platform. Mm -hmm. It will not be on TV, but it will reach, what, thousands of people? Mm -hmm. um, and, and TV can always, you know, be reformed. And, and like, it can always be something else. Radio, however, mm -hmm. reaches out to people who don't even have TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's that powerful platform for information and discourse. So it's fine, TV can go. 
You've got 24 hours, 24 hours on earth. What are you doing? What are you spending them doing? Ah, 24 hours. Probably with people I love mm -hmm. at home. Reminiscing on the Especially the one you won't tell us whom you love very much. My family <laughs> and friends, very close friends. <laughs> um, and uh, probably having, you know, I don't know, good wine. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'll do. So can I get a story to put the on the last day? I'll trust you, me, Jesus, tend what I need. <laughs> He doesn't hate it at all. <laughs> Whoever gave you that and go to the book of Proverbs, it tells you about drinking wine for your time. <laughs> so uh, I would be doing that. And I think if I were to die, um, and knowing when I to die, uh, what to die, I would do prefer to it to happen in the comfort of my home around people I love. I think I've read books and I've, I've had, um, I've listened to people like doctors and nurses who say I, the most painful thing that I hear from people who are about to depart is they wish their loved ones were around them. I hear you. Um, you know, dying lonely and alone, especially when you are aware it's happening. Because unless it's an accident, somebody shoots you in, and, you know. But if you are aware that, okay, I'm actually it's happening right now, it, I would love it to be around people I love and care about. And on that last day, what would you like for people to remember you for? Hmm. I don't know, I just thought of Beyonce's song. I was here. <laughs> uh, what would I like people to remember me for? That I tried my best. Mm -hmm. It's very fair. Mm, that I tried my best. Uh, in everything I did, I tried my best. It might not have come across as my best to you, um, but I tried my best. In love, I tried my best. With family, I tried my best. With friends, I tried my best. Career-wise, I tried my best. With life, just living and trying to have a certain quality of life, mm -hmm. I tried my best. So if anyone would remember me, hopefully somebody does when I die, um, I would love for them to remember that I tried my best. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, television and radio broadcaster, now digital content creator, facilitator, communications and media specialist, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and everything great. Speech, mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming to our podcast. Thank you. Um, our show, me. whatever you'd like to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a growing community. Um, we're enjoying what we do. Mm -hmm. um, we, 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 we look at the comments of what we're doing and we see that there are lives we are touching that we had no, mm -hmm. we, we had no knowledge that the power of the internet could help us touch these lives mm. and that and that has helped us gain the, the level of focus yeah. that we, we we are trying to maintain um, with the platform and we thank people like you mm -hmm. who are established who have been in the game for long for believing in people like us mm. who are relatively new in the space yeah. because it takes for us as Bambani as black people something yeah. that we don't do a lot we're always in competition if the next person comes in we're like why does he think he's the next hottest thing mm. Mm. You know, so we really appreciate people like you who are so experienced um, for, for coming to the show. Thank you. I had a great time. It was fun. And like I said when we started, um, yeah, just keep going. Keep soaring. Silence the noise. Improve. Mm. Grow in what you do. I think it's always beautiful too when you want to do something and do it well. Going back, review. Watch yourself. Uh, think what can I do better. Mm. And may you expand and may you grow. The space is big enough for all of us. And yeah, all the best. Ladies and gentlemen, that was another amazing episode mm -hmm. of Engineer Your Life. I love you. I'll see you next week.